Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to look at another FRQ for AP Human Geography. We're looking at Unit 2. We're going to be discussing population density, economic development, and environmental problems that can result from different population densities. So we have two different stimuli. The first one is a map, and it shows not population density, but something that is indicative of population density, and which is hospital data. The red dots on this dot distribution map represent hospital and green dots represent non-hospitals but are still healthcare facilities. So what can we take away just from reading this map and not get a lot of context from it? Well, we can take away that where there are more hospitals, there are probably more people because there are more people to treat. They're going to build hospitals, which are very expensive. They're going to build them in places where they are going to reach a bunch of people and help and aid a bunch of people, a bunch of people who are sick or have genetic diseases or people who are giving birth. Mother others. The next data that we have is a graph. It's a simple graph. It shows health care expenditures per capita, and it's comparing it between East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And right away, we can see that East Asia has higher health care expenditures than that of Sub-Saharan Africa. So let's go through the different prompts on our FRQ. So part A, something simple. You don't need the stimuli at all. You'll see some of these on the AP exam. You're going to have to give some descriptions or definitions of just the concepts you'll be talking about. So in this case, we're describing a difference between agriculture and physiological density. So the main difference is that agriculture density measures farmers, while physiological density uses people per unit of arable land. A simple thing you could have done is just given the definitions of both of these terms. They're not long. You could have done it in one sentence, and that would be sufficient. But what you should have said is that agriculture density measures farmers per unit, while physiological density measures people per unit of arable land. If you want to say arable land, that's optional. Arable land, just remember, is land that can be farmed. That's different from arithmetic density, which is people per unit of land, all the land within an area. Part B, explain one way that economic development has impacted West Africa's physiological density. So this isn't just specific to West Africa. You could probably think of any place. How does economic development, particularly initial economic development, impacts physiological density? So what you could have said is as people move to cities for jobs, these jobs are typically in non-agriculture sectors. They're not working on farms anymore, but they're working in manufacturing, in industry, or even services. The amount of arable land is going to decrease, and that's going to lead to a higher physiological density because we're going to have a lot more people and a lot less arable land. Economic development can lead to the arable land being converted for industrial, residential, or other commercial purposes, and that's going to, of course, reduce the amount of arable land per person, so the physiological density will increase. If you don't understand if it's going to increase or decrease, write it out like a fraction. Do people over arable land. If we decrease the land and we increase the people because we have people moving into the area, that's going to increase the fraction, so it's going to increase the physiological density. So what these two points are telling us is that as people people are moving into these cities. They're going to convert the farmland to support the people. So they're going to build housing. They're going to build manufacturing facilities and industries. These are the jobs that they're going to be taking up. They're also going to build commercial purposes, stores for people to buy goods and services produced. We're going to see technological advancements in farming, and that could offset the pressure on the arable land, and it produces more food with less land, and that's going to reduce the physiological density. Rural to urban migration can increase the pressure on urban areas to provide food, and that can raise the physiological density as well as they may preserve the land to grow food to feed the high population, the highly dense population, a lot of people in that small amount of area. Economic development may lead to the overuse or poor management of lands. We're looking at environmental effects. And that can cause desertification where the soil turns into sand and desert. You can't really grow crops anymore. Soil erosion where you kind of take away from the fertility of the soil, can't grow crops anymore, as well as pollution. This can be water, air, soil pollution. And that's going to reduce the amount of arable land that is productive in growing crops. So that's going to result in a physiological density increase. So all of these factors are accompanied by economic development in West Africa, and that leads to changes in the physiological density. The most important change that we see here is that the physiological density is probably going to increase. That's a general trend that we see here. So as economic development occurs, and as the manufacturing sector takes off and farms start to decrease, physiological density increases. 
Part C, explain the degree that West Africa's current population density is reflected by the high number of healthcare facilities in the region. So essentially, we're going to have to do two or three different parts to answer this question. The first one is we just got to give a degree, a degree of relevancy. How true is this statement in the prompt? The statement being that West Africa's population density is reflected by the number of healthcare facilities. That statement is very true because we have a lot of healthcare facilities. We have a lot of hospitals in areas with high population densities with lots of people. So we're going to say that there is a high degree here. You have to give a degree. Degree. If you do not give a degree on one of these responses, you forfeit your right to get any of the points. And most of the time, it's only one point, which is not a big deal considering you have six other ones on just this question alone. But that one point could be the determining factor between a two and a three, a three over four, or even a four and a five. So we have to back this up. It's an argumentative prompt. So high degree. Why? Because the large number of healthcare facilities in West Africa support high population densities. Okay, that's our kind of backing up statement. But we have to continue this a little bit. We have to elaborate. These explain the degrees are your most extensive prompts. So you're supposed to give a more extensive, a more in-depth and written analysis and answer. So why is there a high population density to support? Why are there a high number of healthcare facilities? Yes, there's a high population density, but what does that mean? What does does that mean when there's a high population density? That means that there's more health care needs, particularly maternal and child health care. We see an increased prevalence of diseases because everyone's so close together. It's very easy to cough and if someone gets sick from the disease you have. It requires easy access to health care facilities. It can be for simple stuff like antibiotics. There's a need for improved health care access to address health disparities because when we see urban developments occur, we don't see a uniform health care pattern. We see different health disparities disparities between different regions. Part D, explain one possible environmental phenomenon that could occur in West Africa as a result of its current population distribution. So this is just asking for an environmental effect due to the high population density in West Africa. So we could see increased demand for land and construction for housing, agriculture, and infrastructure, and that can lead to a loss of forestry. Increased industrial activity because we see a lot of manufacturing typically occurring in urban areas. We see vehicular emissions because vehicles are going slower and they're all concentrated. And a lot of urban waste by the ton of people living there. That can lead to high levels of pollution, particularly air pollution. We could also see soil and water pollution. High demand on water resources to meet the needs for a large population, not just in having them to drink, but also to bathe and grow crops to feed them. That can decrease the water availability. Densely populated areas with inadequate drainage systems can experience more severe flooding during heavy rains. When they build these cities, they don't typically equip them with proper drainage systems. When they put in the concrete and the roads, they're not porous to water, so they're going to flood more heavily. E, compare fertility rates between sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa. Asia. So when we see these compare prompts, typically when you see the word compare, you think of similarities. And that may be the case in a lot of questions, but in some questions, it may be to give differences. It's not typically going to ask for both similarities and differences. You're going to know right away which one you're giving. Now, here we're just stating a difference between Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. We're looking at the fertility rates. And what we're actually probably going to have to look at is that graph from before. So let's look at this. So we see the healthcare expenditures in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. It's higher in East Asia, and that probably means that they have more advanced and more accessible healthcare facilities. And in countries and regions with better healthcare systems, we're going to see typically lower fertility rates, lower birth rates, because the infant mortality rate is lower, the maternal mortality rate is lower. We see access to contraception as well and family planning services so people can not have kids or even delay having kids. So let's look at some responses here to that. So the fertility rate is higher in Sub-Saharan Africa than East Asia because they have less developed healthcare systems. And when we're discussing infant mortality rates, something that people ask me is why are the birth rates higher in countries with high infant mortality rates? Wouldn't it be the opposite? No, because in countries with high infant mortality rates, there's a high chance that your child is going to die very, very young. There's a very low chance it's going to survive to adulthood. So parents have a lot of children because that provides an insurance that some of them will survive to adulthood. 
Part F, explain one reason for why Sub-Saharan Africa has lower healthcare expenditures than that of East Asia. So why do they spend less? Well, there's limited financial resources. High poverty levels restrict the government budgets for healthcare. You could have also just said people can't afford it as much as in East Asia. That would, would be what I think is the most popular response. You could also said there's a significant reliance on international donors or foreign aid, and that can lead to inconsistent funding each year. There's also different investment priorities. Maybe there's not a focus on healthcare. We see a lot of population growth. It's very high total fertility rates in East, uh, not East, Sub-Saharan African countries. So with a lot of children being born, they're going to emphasize maybe infrastructure to support the large amount of people and education to educate the high number of children. Healthcare becomes a major focus in more developed countries with high mid-adults and elderly populations with more healthcare needs. We also see economic growth. There's more economic growth in East Asia. So they're going to have stronger economies that allow for more healthcare spending and investments. We see worse infrastructure and healthcare systems in Sub Saharan Africa. And that could also lead to inefficient use of funds. And we also have a shortage of trained healthcare professionals in Sub Saharan Africa compared to East Asia. And that can reduce the efficiency and spending on healthcare. Part G, explain the effect of the current number of healthcare facilities in one of the countries below on their stage on the ETM. So remember, the ETM is a model that just correlates with the DTM, but discuss the causes of deaths and the healthcare within those countries. So let's start with Nambia, which is in stage two. Now, it doesn't ask for the stage. So that doesn't mean the stage, that means the stage isn't required, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't list the stage because that's going to help you answer this question. If you don't know the stage, you're probably going to have a harder time answering the question here. Now, we got two countries. We got this one and we had Nigeria. And when they do that, they're probably going to be different countries or not different countries, but different stages. So you're probably going to discuss different stuff. If they were the exact same, they would have only given one of them here. So we can use this map actually to help us answer the question because we could look at Nigeria and see that there are a lot more hospitals and non-hospitals compared to Nambia. So we could probably use that to answer our question. Nigeria has more healthcare facilities. They're probably a little more developed. So Nambia is in stage two. No countries in stage one. Nigeria, I would say, is in stage three. So let's explain this now on their stage in the ETM. How does that correlate? Nambia has few healthcare facilities per capita, particularly in rural areas. We see the concentrations more in urban areas where more people are, and that's going to affect access to essential med Medicare services, and that'll lower expenditures. That kind of connects to our graph. You could have also said the scarcity of healthcare resources contributes to a higher prevalence of infectious diseases. Remember, stage two of the ETM shows a high prevalence of infectious diseases, particularly viral infections, and individuals may struggle to access preventative care and treatment for these infections. The lack of facilities can lead to high mortality rates from preventable diseases. Countries that are more developed, like the United States, have a lot more treatments for symptoms and the diseases that people may acquire, particularly in stage two, these infectious diseases. So without those treatments, these diseases are going to dominate the landscapes and they're going to be reported in higher numbers. Let's look at Nigeria. Nigeria is in stage three. Again, the stage isn't required, but it's going to help you answer the question. So urbanized in areas, Nigeria is urbanizing heavily. They have high population densities. They're going to have more healthcare services. So they're going to have high population numbers that can access healthcare. The presence of more facilities allows for better management of infectious diseases, as well as the rising and emerging prevalence of non-infectious diseases. And we call these either chronic or degenerative diseases. And these can be examples like diabetes, diabetes, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and cardiovascular diseases, which is a heart disease. We could also see cancer, lung disease, kidney disease, substance abuse, allergies, all of those pop up as well. The growing number of healthcare facilities can facilitate earlier diagnoses and treatment of diseases, and that contributes to lower mortality rates and a transition towards healthier lifestyles as well. So what are the takeaways from this FRQ? So there are seven points on each FRQ. You'll have three of them on the AP exams. There's no partial credit, no half credit, no extra credits. And FRQs are 50% of your score. If you plan on passing this AP exam, you're going to need to get some points. It'll vary depending on if you want a three or a five. Obviously, if you want a five, you're going to want to get some more. You want to get five or six out of the seven points. Now, if you're not there quite yet, if you're watching this still early in the year, you have months to prepare and do so many FRQs, your hand will hurt. And 
and you will get so much better before the AP exam. But the best advice is to just do as many FRQs as possible. And I'm here to help you with that. So let's look at the content. So we had a compare prompt. Part, part E was a compare prompt. Now those can be very straightforward. It can be which one has a higher total fertility rate or a doubling time. Or it can mean you need to give some similarities or differences here. Knowing your geography and where countries and regions are is very, very important. So the course and exam description makes an effort to emphasize different world regions. There's actually a map that you need to kind of know the, with the different world regions. And knowing where your countries are is going to very much so help you identify basic trends. And in this unit, that's very, very particular. So you kind of want to know where some major countries are. Regarding our population densities, just as a review, our arithmetic density is the number of people over all of the land. Physiological density is the number of people over arable land, that is land that can be farmed. And agriculture density is the number of farmers per unit of arable land. Countries with higher population growth rates, we see these with high natural increase rates, high total fertility rates, high crude birth rates. They're the most urbanizing, and they have the lowest number of healthcare facilities. They're in stage two of the DTM. As countries enter stage three, like Nigeria or the UAE or Mexico, their natural increase rates will decline because their total fertility rates will drop. We typically see this with a drop in the infant mortality rates. Their urban areas are more established, they're still growing, and they include accessible healthcare facilities. When we see stage two of the ETM, we're still talking about stage two of the DTM, and we see a prevalence of infectious diseases. In stage three, with the with more sanitation and access to healthcare and medicine, like antibiotics, we see a decline in infectious diseases significantly, and we see an emergence of degenerative diseases like diabetes and cancer. Most sub-Saharan African countries are in stage two of the DTM. Some countries are in stage three. Some countries in Africa, like Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt. You'll have one to two explain the degree prompts on the AP exam. Not one to two per uh, question, but one to two on the entire exam. These are supposed to be the most extensive questions. That's why they're not so prominent. But you do need to be able to do them. So you need to give a degree of relevancy. You need to say how true it is. You can say either high or low. Now, since this is an argumentative prompt, you're going to have to back yourself up and give sentences explaining why it is either a high degree or why it's a low degree. If you feel really strongly that it's a high degree, you should have an easy time backing yourself up. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really does help me out and it costs zero dollars. I have some free resources for you in the description down below. Below if you'd like to use them. If you have any AP Human Geography related questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below the video or send me a message on Discord. I'll see you guys in the next video though. Adios.